there's energy with me and thanks. the app. Thanks. There's a red dot. Does that mean it's going? It's going. My name is Jessica Wilson. I'm a registered dietitian at the University of Oregon. I am an adjunct instructor there as well as the dietitian at the health center. I have been working on the eating disorders treatment team at the University of Oregon for four years and have been able to see the impact of weight bias and weight stigma on my uh, patients who have eating disorders and those who are there for primary care. I have also, um, via our state's insurance policy, gotten to witness firsthand the impact that having a requirement of waist circumference um, as part of our insurance policy, how that impacts um, the care of individuals who choose to participate uh, and provide their waist circumference or not, and how that, um, oh man, I have to start all over. No, I'm sorry. Good thing about pain. We've got pain. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're yeah. fancy like that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll make you look good. Don't okay, worry. good. And <laughs> <laughs> laughing, and how. The um, requirement for a waist circumference impacts people of socioeconomic status differently. Those who can afford to opt out of the program have the ability to do so. Those, like the colleagues of mine who say clean up our health center in the evening or provide food service to the 25,000 students on our campus, do not have the opportunity and therefore are subjected to the shame that they feel when entering their waist circumference in for the um, baseline requirement of health insurance. Through all of this experience, I have been able to witness how different groups in different socioeconomic statuses have different and a multitude of barriers to seeking health care. People who do not make as much money as those who are their colleagues and are more privileged and have higher income, unfortunately have far less options when it comes to healthcare, have far less um, access when it comes to healthcare, and are far more likely to go without seeking healthcare services because it is not worth the added and additional effort when people of lower socioeconomic status are also larger in larger bodies, this creates an added layer. Oftentimes this creates a history of trauma from their experience. Add that trauma to the layers of barrier that come with lower socioeconomic status and not coming from a privileged background. And people in larger bodies at lower socioeconomic statuses can be at a great disadvantage when they show up to your office. So when they're at your office, hopefully you can keep all of this in mind and instead focus on the individual and recognize how hard it was for them to just show up. That takes a lot of courage to just be in your office. So when that happens, hopefully you can look at them and not make assumptions about what they tell you. Hopefully you believe what they tell you. And after hearing their stories, hopefully then you become an advocate for people in larger bodies. When you start to gather their stories after you've listened to them, hopefully you then are interested in joining me as I advocate for health at every size programs and initiatives so that people in all body sizes and shapes feel comfortable coming to the office, have less trauma once they've sat down, and know that they're going to be listened to. If you're interested, you can find me on the As to website. Okay. We're gonna, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Oh, great. And we're just going to just give real, like, short, you know what I mean? I can do short. Awesome. Tell me short. Um, so can you talk about the difference 
in what seems like a small copay when you're a doctor versus when you're cleaning the doctor's office. Just a short thing about that. Right. Oh, you asked. That was the question. That was the question. <laughs> So a copay for someone who makes enough money to be middle class or upper class, um, definitely privileged, more privileged than somebody in low economic status, likely means the difference between dinner. Um, $20, $30 for a copay can mean whether or not somebody gets to play sports or engage in extracurricular activities, depending on where you live. Also that $20, uh, can indicate whether or not somebody gets to participate in weekend activities with friends. So what is the difference in access to healthy behavior, like exercise or yes. food, or what's the difference in, in access to those things for rich people versus poor people? So in the state of Oregon itself, uh, Portland is the whitest big city. They were just doing some great research on the availability of parks in the lower socioeconomic status areas. Access to physical activity is very different. It looks different for folks in uh, lower income areas. The access to safe physical activity is a lot harder to find. The access to food that is fresh and nutrient dense versus calorically dense is much smaller. Uh, the access to uh, transportation to find the uh, nutrient-dense food is much lower. So the difference in, well, I'll add it back, having a copay of 20 or $30 is a big impact, especially when you need to gather a lot of children to get on a bus to get there. And then um, talk about the difference in how difficult it is for a, um, a person, a, like getting time off of work to go to the doctor, the right. difference. So a lot of jobs and, uh, that support low-income families don't provide sick pay. You need to take time out of work to get there. Not only do you have to take time that is then not paid to get to a doctor's appointment, you also then um, risk your uh, job status as somebody who needs to leave work to get there. Uh, time out of work is really not supported and a lot of low-paying, low-income jobs. Great. So can you talk about how that affects um, preventative care versus? Sure. So when people aren't able to make proactive or preventative health care uh, appointments, they end up only receiving or seeking out sick care. Uh, not until something happens, and something happens that is visible to someone that doesn't have a lot of medical knowledge, do they end up in your office versus taking the steps to make sure that they're healthy and well for the long term. You can talk about the di how um, when patients don't, aren't able to get preventative care, mm -hmm. it costs more? Oh yeah. So when speaking and wanting to reduce healthcare costs, the biggest um, measure that one can take is making sure that everybody has equal access to health care. So not, not only those who have privileged time in the workspace and money to attend can have preventative care, but anyone has same access to health care and we're able to um, adequately serve everyone in our community, not just those that are more privileged than others. I'm just asking you lots of questions. Keep going. Awesome, so I'm just getting good stuff. No, stuff. keep going. Um, You're good. I, want, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about intersectionality and how having multiple areas of stigma affects. I mean, yes. you, you addressed it a little bit no. in your longer thing, but. Yes. Speaking from a, uh, as a, let's start over. As a person of color, I definitely understand the barriers that um, black folk have when seeking care in the first place. Um, I don't need to tell you the dirge of historical, um, let's see, okay. yeah, well I was going to say, I was, I was looking for Tuskegee, but let's say, oh, what is it, clinical trials, okay, yeah, yeah, yes, 
Okay. <laughs> Speaking as a person of color, um, I know firsthand how hard it is to seek care um, from someone who doesn't share my experience. Um, there is a long, dark history of using black folks um, in, in, ex in experimental trials since they were not considered as um, valuable to society as white folk. So that creates one layer of barrier when seeking care in the first place. Another would be um, lower socioeconomic status if somebody um, was in that category. And then or having a fat body would create an additional layer of assumptions that a medical provider could make about me and then having um, those as intersecting identities could create a really, really large barrier to seeking care in the first place, to seeking preventive care, to getting the care that's going to prevent chronic diseases in the long run, to preventing those chronic diseases that are supposedly what is costing us millions and millions of dollars. Yet, if we took the steps to be proactive in removing those barriers and creating space, safe spaces in creating care that was culturally competent and that was not based on assumptions. We could, in the end, I believe, save this country a lot of money just by making people feel safe when seeking care. That was it. Awesome. That was perfect. Is there anything else you want to add? I have one question. Yeah, yeah. That, um, That's okay. What, why do you think it's important yeah. from the inside out, the Africans from the inside out? <coughs> yes. That's, I was in the mirror with that one. It's been lost in the sleep, but I've, I've got it. Okay. <clears throat> As a clinician, I have a lot of power that my patients don't have. As a medical doctor, you have a lot of power that both your patients don't have and I don't have. With a lot of power, I do think, comes a lot of responsibility and a lot of access to information and resources that both patients and different clinicians don't have. I think it's great when people want to use their power for good. I think that that good could be increasing access to healthcare for all folks, increasing health at every size, healthcare for everyone, and for improving the quality of health of your community, of our community, of the nation as a whole. Okay, well we can just use her whole tape. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's completely awesome. wrapped it. Is that what you were looking oh, for? Yeah. yeah.